The Association of the United States Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's New Report webinar series. This webinar series features presentations by senior Army leaders responsible for key programs and initiatives. It also features contemporary military authors who weave together the past, present, and future story of the United States Army. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's Vice President of Education, Lieutenant General Retired Guy Swan. Good after, afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Association of the United States Army's Noon Report. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We appreciate your support in the defense of our great nation. Joining us for today's discussion are Colonel Arnell David, First Sergeant Sean Acosta, and Dr. Nicholas Crowley. They're the authors of Getting Competition Wrong, The U.S. Military's Looming Failure. The moderator for today's discussion is Brigadier General Chris Stockel, U.S. Army retired. General Stockel is a career Army Civil Affairs officer and currently serves as the Vice President for the Civil Affairs Association's Western Region. For those joining us online today, please take advantage of having the authors here to ask questions. You can use the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen to submit a question. And after the discussion, we'll take as many questions as time allows. You can also find the bios, the full bios, for all of our guests at the handouts tab. And without, with that, I'll turn the floor over to General Stockel to tell us a bit more about our guests. Chris, over to you. Sir, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, what a pleasure to be here um, at uh, AUSA uh, Noontime Report. Thank you, sir. Hey, so first up, we have uh, Colonel Arnel David. He's an Army strategist and formal civil affairs officer working at NATO. Uh, he's the co-author of Military Strategy in the 21st Century, and he co-authored that with uh, Lieutenant General Retired Charlie Cleveland, uh, Dr. Sue Bryan, and Dr. Ben Jensen. He's currently completing a PhD at King's College in London. Uh, we also have Dr. Nick Crowley. He's an independent advisor on the human domain of conflict and competition. He's worked and is working with the US, UK, NATO forces in the fields of civil reconnaissance and civil resistance. Uh, he also provides direct support and capability building uh, for our allied military and intelligence services in Iraq, Ukraine, Nigeria, and other countries. And last but not least is First Sergeant Sean Acosta. He's a civil affairs non-commissioned officer currently assigned to the 98th Civil Affairs Battalion. He spent the last three years training and leading soldiers to deploy throughout South and Central America. Uh, he's seeking uh, innovative training solutions while serving as the first sergeant and 7th Special Forces Group Information Warfare Detachment, NCOIC. Men, thanks for joining us today. Uh, exciting uh, AUSA new report. Thanks to the audience and uh, at all at AUSA that helped make this event possible. Uh, please take a few minutes, starting with Colonel David, to explain uh, your expanded comments on the article you recently co-authored, Getting Competition Wrong, the U.S. Military's Looming Failure. Over to you, Arnell. Hey, thank you, General Stockel, uh, General Swan. A big thanks to AUSA for this opportunity to share our ideas and contribute to this debate. Uh, AUSA continues to help us improve by being an intellectual hub for the U.S. Army, so really appreciate this opportunity. So today we're discussing competition in this new, or maybe not so new, great game. The, uh, the global system's unraveling, Iran continues to spread influence in the Middle East. China is encroaching all over the Asia Pacific, Africa, South America, and a revanchist Russia is pushing boundaries in Eastern Europe. There's a global fight for influence. U.S. hegemony is under attack. And we need to exercise humility to learn and see why and how is this happening to us. We need to learn from the good and bad in Iraq and Afghanistan. So as T.E. Lawrence once said many, you know, a long time ago, uh, with 2,000 years of examples behind us, we have no excuse when fighting for not fighting well. And the same holds true for competition. The U.S. Army doesn't have the luxury of just being good at one thing. We have to be versatile to secure our nation's interest. So throughout the webinar, two questions drive our discussion. One, 
how do we, the military, examine and make sense of the competition continuum? And two, how do we optimize the U.S. military to compete therein? The services have addressed competition and uh, they've written white papers and doctoral notes, but we, the, the authors of this last article, want to still challenge conventional wisdom. So let me change the slide here. Okay. So our perspective on competition, we believe, is incomplete. In some ways, it's wrong. So as Antulio Echeverria, or Echeverria from uh, the U.S. Army War College has been arguing for quite some time, uh, the U.S. Army has more of a way of battle than a way of war. We prepare to fight the wars we wish to fight, those that are fast, decisive, and lethal. And all of our concepts and doctrine reflect this. And of course, the U.S. Army must be always ready to fight and win our nation's wars. It is the essence of our existence. However, we need to take a more conservative look at how we compete to set conditions for when we do have to fight. So we need to connect to our battlefield victories to the political and social cultural dynamics at play in the environment to achieve strategic effects and obtain our nation's political ends. We conveniently ignore the messy contextual dynamics and pay little attention to the human, human domain. Our recent failures in, a, in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, illuminate this shortfall and we must learn. You know, Vietnam veterans, they, they once lamented that they wouldn't have to fight this kind of fight. They don't want to fight these messy, uncomfortable, irregular conflicts amongst the people. But as we know, we will find ourselves in these types of wars and we, in the army, on land, will inevitably be you know, fighting amongst the people. So we got to get better at it. The way we compete is key to success in the long game. And we must think long term to be strategic as an army and as a nation. There are questions on this slide I'm not going to read to you, but what we ask is that you look at them and internalize them. And we can see right now what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, we can learn a lot from the Russians and, and the Ukrainians, and, and we'll cover some of this off uh, in, in the discussion. But before I hand over to Nick Crowley, uh, I just want to make two final um, quick points. So first off, organizational innovation. We're not arguing for a massive change to the Army and military. We know there's no room for growth and a big change. But the change required is not expensive. And what we need is, again, organizational innovation. A sliver of the Army needs to get better at human domain engagement. And it might be helpful if I, you know, maybe show you what, the, what, this, what you might imagine this might look like by just giving examples. So for, for present and future commanders at all ranks, who are you going to turn to when you need an assessment of the populace, of the people, to understand the tribal, societal dynamics, the rituals, fear, honor, interests, politics, corruption practices, criminal activity networks? We need people that can, you know, interpret the human domain, interpret the, 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 the societal factors in the environment. How will you know that your messaging will be received and not offend people? You know, big data scrap, you can only do so much and, and to, to answer this. And I know Nick's going to talk to this later, but we need to get better at it. The intel community will answer some of this as, way, as well. But uh, as we found in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Philippines, Colombia, and elsewhere, you need people who can, who can do this, who can understand this crew component of the environment, the human domain. There is no substitute for ground context. And if we continue to go blind into these environments, we will squander you know, precious resources get manipulated and we will fail. So Sean Cross is gonna discuss later how we have small teams and units doing this at the tactical level. We need to get better at aggregating their work and making sense of it, synthesize the information better to inform decision makers. So my final point, point two, integrated deterrence. As laid out in our national defense strategy, it's causing rich debate. Does it mean more forward presence or less? Does it mean we have to rely on our integration with allies and partners and do more episodic engagement? Whatever it means, it means that relationships are going to be vital and important. We can't just focus on, the, on our opponents and be enemy-centric. We, we don't want to be up here exploitive with our engagements. We need to genuinely care and listen to our partners about their concerns. We need to invest and maintain relationships. There's this negative stigma that I think I want to highlight for you, but, you know, that we got to overcome. You know, I often hear from me and my soldiers and peers, like, I got to cut ties with our partners or my friends because I don't want to mess up my security clearance. And I think this is kind of a, you know, a myth, you know, you can still, you know, if we're going to be uh, episodically engaged, these relationships are going to matter. So you can report these, to, you know, when you do your periodic, uh, you know, security clearance update, you can report these relationships because every one of us is going to matter. This is why we, we send foreign students to our schools so we can have these relationships over time. Um, so please, relationships matter, and each one of us is going to, you know, play an important part of that. The U.S. Army is the premier fighting force on this planet, and many of our partners look up with us, look up to us. So we can't appear to be transactional. We have to be genuine. We have to be friends. And our network of partners and allies is a center of gravity our enemies do not have. 
and they wish to attack. Currently out, out in Eastern Europe, you know, SFAB, the 4th SFAB, 5th Corps Forward, NATO Shape, Generals Chris Cavoli, Matthew Van Wagenen, they're out there doing this in spades in Eastern Europe, but we need to maintain the momentum and sustain it. So in sum, to compete more effectively, let's look beyond just the enemy. Let's think more holistically about the environment to account for the human moral component, and let's keep relationships strong. You know, if we look at multi-domain operations as well as integrated deterrence, the human domain is of paramount importance. You know, Sean's gonna cover off on uh, improved capabilities, but I'll hand over now to Nick to discuss how we master this playing field. Thank you. Thanks, Arnell. Nick? Thanks, Arnell, I appreciate it. And, you know, when we talk about having a different view into competition, you know, the expression we use in the article is the need to master the playing field, right? And what is that? You know, what are we talking about there? And what we're talking about is broadening the view of how we come at this, of what we look for uh, and how we look as an army, as someone, you know, as an entity preparing to compete or to fight. And I think at the, at the start, we have to talk about technology, right? And the role of technology with respect to what it can do the advantages it confers, uh, but also what it can't do, which isn't often part of the discussion when we get into chat about the fourth industrial revolution. And, you know, right now we have staggering inflows of data. Uh, we have the ability to sift and sort to find patterns and trends. Uh, and, and this gives us unprecedented clarity on what is happening around the world. All right. And we can get that without necessarily being there. All right. But it doesn't tell us much about why all this is happening. All right. It doesn't tell us what, you know, we don't know what the data means. We don't know what we should do in response. And, and we're talking about causal understanding, you know, establishing cause and effect between events, establishing what patterns mean. Now, this is critical to military decision making from way down at the tactical level all the way up to the top. And, you know, big data analytics, the, four, the whole fourth industrial revolution toolkit. It really doesn't do this. You know, it really stops at correlation and pattern identification. Uh, and I think it's easy to say that's not good enough, right? And I go a step past that and say it's actually dangerous potentially. All right. And I say that because you give me a data set, all right, I, I can tell any story field where enemy attacks are rising, our casualties are surging. Civilian harm is escalating. IDPs are flowing out. The prices of goods are going up. What does that mean, right? Are we winning or are we losing? All right, is this the enemy on the upswing or is this sort of the last gasp of a desperate adversary lashing out at anything in sight? You know, the data in and of itself tells us nothing, right? And I think our own domestic politics are helpful here, right? We can all look to the U.S. right now. You know, inflation is through the roof. Why is that? All right. The explanation depends a whole lot on your politics. It depends a whole lot on your agenda. And, and I think that, you know, our own intelligence architecture leaves us vulnerable to this. It leaves us open to this because what we don't really have in our approach to the human domain is any structured, serious effort to establish cause and effect. All right. And to understand why things are happening and what it means. All right. We have no framework. We have no real process, no real analytical, analytical methodology to understand an enemy, adversary, competitor, call it what you want, as an actual integral feature of the competitive environment, of the human domain, right? You know, J2 has its own silo. We're good in there, right? We're comfortable with that and our abilities. But that's very limited, right? There's a hard left and right to that. And it covers, what, maybe 10% of an operational environment? Outside that 10% is the civil environment, all right? What's there? You know, how are we looking at this? And you have capabilities like civil affairs, not just CA, but civil affairs probably near the top of that list, trying to find their way through this 90% without structure, without process, without method. Um, you dig into doctrine, you wind up really with ASCOPE, MISI, things like that, which simply aren't investigative frameworks. And so... We don't know what questions to ask. We don't know what we want to know. We don't know what to do with it when we find it. And we don't have, you know, why, why should the army writ large commanders care about it? We don't have compelling, serious, reliable answers to that. And so 
what is the end result? You know, J2 analysis comes into staff, civil affairs, civil consideration analysis comes into staff. There's all kinds of data swirling around. And you've got, you know, men and women with the best of intentions trying to make sense of it all and trying to establish causal relationships to make sense of why things are happening. And they wind up having to ascribe meaning to data sets and to information to put these puzzle pieces together in a framework that is virtually impossible, wherein the results you get are really a function of individual talent, individual instinct, all right, and not a real methodology. So there's an element of guesswork here, all right, and it's also something very easily politicized, all right, and we can talk about Afghanistan in that context and being, you know, turning the corner for 15, 20 years when actually we were kind of treading water or sinking. So, you know, what is the answer here, right? Um, you know, we would make the case that the Army needs a structured, serious approach to the human domain, right? To understanding enemies, adversaries in context as a feature of that environment, okay? How do we look at this, you know, and to plant the seed, I guess, of an idea, uh, I'd offer you the, the metaphor of a, of a tree, right? We think branches and limbs, all right? That's the enemy. That's the adversary. That kind of visual of a network, I think, jives in really well with traditional J2, the, the link analysis software platforms of the world, all right? That's where J2 looks. But there's more to it than that, right? There's a root structure, okay? That's our segue into the human environment, into the human terrain. And if we understand how those roots are established, you know, how these things are happening, it gives us a framework for onward contextual analysis. I apologize for noise. We've got massive storms coming through here. Um, but this is the kind of approach where, you know, if we can broaden our view from that enemy-centric J2 lens, capture the roots of an adversary, of an enemy in the wider human domain, and then follow that root structure within a single coherent investigative process, you know, we start to get a much more structured view and we start to go after cause and effect because that, that's not easy to find, right? Causal understanding is easy to talk about, but truth, quote unquote, is, is disputed, it's contested, it's, it's obscured by enemies, right? But the very act of pursuing it in a serious manner, I think gets us somewhere we need to go. Uh, and to talk now, I'll pass this off to Sean, um, to look at the capabilities that are out there. Uh, They're working on this right now. Thanks, Nick. Sean, over to you. Yes, sir. Hey, thanks, Nick. Uh, yeah, so as Dr. Crowley was um, stating, I'm going to talk a little bit about the capabilities. I mean, he alluded to a lot of the things that I'm going to uh, discuss. I just want to preface all of this. If I mention a, a particular branch within the Army uh, or something that isn't properly happening, it's not, it's not a knock on them. Um, this is just something that we see, issues we see, and, and to, to go forward. So I'll kind of jump in at the point where we left off about understanding this environment. Um, we are not saying that technology is not important. We need technology, right? We have to be innovative in the, in the technological realm. However, we feel that sometimes we're over-reliant on that technology to provide answers that it, it simply can't. Uh, as Dr. Crowley said, uh, you know, there's questions that we have to ask uh, this investigative process. We don't have a, a framework for it. Uh, to do these things, but we will put ISR platforms into the air and expect these to come back and, and provide all the answers for an operational environment. But it's simply, it, it, it can't work. Um, and furthermore, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have the J2, as Dr. Crowley said, but the intel community uh, within the Army, you know, we have scouts that will go out and uh, recon these areas and observe and report back this data to them. But that data is all threat centric, right? Uh, it is not focused on the 90% of the operational environment. It's not, you know, 90% of that environment is not the enemy. Um, is the enemy there? Yes, of course. But they're using those networks and these these different root systems, if, if you will, that uh, Nick uh, alluded to, to enable them. Um, you know, if we don't take the time to understand that or invest in capabilities that allow us to understand that, then we're going to continue to spin, spin our wheels. Um, and some of those capabilities that we have you know, uh, the civil affairs and as a civil affairs, not commission officer, you know, that's that's one of the, the things I'm, I'm going to allude to it. And it's not the only capability. There's many capabilities within the Army, uh, lots of information related capabilities that can provide a lot of the answers that that we need. However, oftentimes they're marginalized. 
uh, on staffs uh, and elsewhere, and they're not really included in the planning process. And there's massive amounts of data that they have that can be sifted through and if integrated properly uh, within the Intel community. It's going to provide a lot of the answers that maneuver commanders need up front before they even get onto the battlefield. Uh, and this will prepare them. You know, it'll help them identify specific capabilities within their own arsenal that they need to employ um, to to compete with these uh, our our adversaries throughout the world. Um, so one of the things that I'm, I'm specifically going to hit on a capability. You know, we talk about these uh, global engagements. Civil affairs teams are all over the world uh, interacting daily with these partners that we have. Uh, and just to bring it kind of back a little bit, you know, those those teams are not threat focused per se, right? Obviously we, we're in a, we work for um, geographic combat commanders and for uh, special operations commanders, the theater special operations commanders. So yes, we are involved in the threat and we're looking at that, but we are looking more at the partners that are in those areas that we can um, work alongside of that understand those nuances of what, what is actually happening on the ground at the tactical level. You know, one of the things that we, we alluded to in the article is that most politics are local. Um, you know, we, we inherently know that as Americans, you can turn on the news and look around, you can look in your, your communities and see that politics are local, but yet when we deploy broad, uh, abroad, we simply stop at the nation level and we do not dig down into the, uh, into those local levels and understand those local nuances. Um, and we have the capabilities to do that. Uh, we need to invest more in them. Uh, civil affairs, one of our tactical mission tasks is civil reconnaissance. It's not necessarily recognized by the um, Center of Maneuver Excellence or Maneuver Center of Excellence at Fort Benning as a as a form of reconnaissance. You know, and you will be told by scouts that they can do this, and they absolutely can. Sure, they can go and observe the civil populace, but they're not trained to do it. Um, they're not specifically trained like civil affairs uh, NCOs and officers are uh, operating in those areas. They don't understand the nuances that we have, but we need to invest heavily in those. In the 95th Civil Affairs Brigade. First Special Forces Command have invested in those capabilities, and we're starting to see some of those things um, as our as our teams deploy broadly, uh, or abroad rather. Um, so I guess that's what I will conclude with is you know, we really have to take a hard look at the capabilities that we we have. Yes. Um, we need to invest in appropriate capabilities, and maybe that's at the expense of some of these technological um, advances that we have. But I would argue that it, it probably won't eat into that budget much, right? We're not talking about purchasing large, um, you know, aircraft carriers or anything for civil affairs teams. We're talking about enabling a branch in order to do these things or other branches within the army that can also do these things. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, General Stockel. Hey, Sean, thank you very much. Hey, wow, gentlemen, uh, you've all covered a tremendous amount of information in those opening comments. If I were to synthesize the main points uh, Arnell, it sounds like your view of the competition is wrong because we continue to flounder in the human domain. Nick, I get your key takeaway is the U.S. Army does not have a coherent investigative approach to the human domain and urgently needs one. And finally, Sean, you believe we have specialized capability, uh, specialized capabilities at the tactical level, um, but it's important that we cohere them uh, better operationally to achieve better effects and ensure uh, we can compete more effectively in this strategic environment. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, men, for the opening comments. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it out here and then we'll go to an the audience. So if you were a senior uniformed or civilian DOD or Army leader, what is the one change that needs attention right now for the Army to better compete more effectively for the joint force and the mission in strategic competition in the same order? Uh, uh, go ahead, Arnell. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you so much. Um, so that's a good question. So one thing that I think we need to do, you know, for the Army, for the joint force is to take, do a fundamental reexamination of the capabilities that reside within this human domain enterprise that are gonna help us fight and compete more effectively. So of course we come from, we're connected to the civil affairs uh, branch, but I think there's the, the, I don't know if we've sorted out the uh, influence, uh, PSYOP, you know, IO capabilities, like how do these all connect 
and uh, you know, har- you know, how do we harmonize these different effects so that you know we get some synergy in the environment? I, I mean, I I think we need a fundamental external evaluation of what these capabilities are, and because I think there's too many people close to the problem that are not willing to change their branch or change their organization because they don't want to, you know, they want to maintain status quo. There's, you know, there's no incentive to make these changes, but I really do think we need a fundamental re-examination of all these capabilities. Thanks, Arnell. Nick? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think the Army as a whole, I mean, this is something that it includes CA, but it's sort of above and beyond. I mean, the, the Army as a whole has to make a decision about what matters. In, in beyond the enemy, beyond an adversary. What is it we want to know? What is it that's important? Do we take this seriously? Uh, and, and to whatever extent the answer is yes to parts of these questions, you know, we need a real framework to get those answers. You know, we don't have one right now. Right now we have siloed investigative approaches into different lines of inquiry, different parts of, uh, of the human domain or of an operational environment, right? We need to figure out serious investigative process and method to get to this. And there's a, a question that came in about, you know, ASCO Promisi as a, a framework to identify things. And I'd say it absolutely isn't that. It's not an investigative tool at all. It's a taxonomy, right? It gives us boxes in which we can categorize information. You know, the, the metaphor I use, it's for librarians, right? You know where to put something, you know, based on it, it's where it fits in the box. That is not an investigative approach. You know, we need lines of how these things interconnect in a complex dynamic environment. Uh, And just having that grid, you know, is, you know, you could validate it as a presentation tool uh, at a very high level. But if we want to really dig in and understand things, uh, I don't think it's fit for purpose at all. Uh, And yet it's everywhere, right? Across US Army doctrine, you know, across the U.S. government, to NATO, to our allies, etc., cetera. And I, the fact that we don't appreciate its inadequacy is a pretty tough endorsement of the fact that, you know, the Army overall hasn't taken this nearly seriously enough. But we don't realize we're not getting it done uh, to the extent that we're not. Thank you. Sean? Sean? Yes, sir. So... Again, I'm just going to go back to uh, invest in relevant capabilities. That's the one thing I would I would ask. And there's a couple of questions I see coming up in the Q and A. Um, you know, some uh, some some folks uh, discussing the you know, Department of State's role in this historically, which it I I agree. I think all all of us on we've had this discussion several times. Like this is um, you know Department of State should be those expertise that we go to um, in those areas. However, there's been budget cuts. They're simply not. They're simply not there, um, and they're they're doing what they can with what they have. Uh, and you know, our foreign policy has been. You know, the military has been at the forefront of that for a while. Um, and there's expectations now from the military to do this. I also saw something in there about how how do we expect the civil affairs team to understand foreign environments uh, if we can't understand our own, uh, you know, environment here in the U.S. One, I would say the U.S. is a very complicated country. Uh, is much larger than most of the rest of the world. And two, we're not asking civil affairs to understand an entire country. We're asking civil affairs to understand specific areas within countries and these specific populations that are there. Um, and sometimes, you know, I, 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 I just offer that, you know, we can't just say, how do we expect this to happen? And then just pass by that, you know, that I don't think that's a, a, a fair answer to say, how do we expect these guys to do this? Um, because they are doing it. I see it. I see it from reporting as a first sergeant. I've seen it, um, you know, as a team sergeant when I was there. I've seen it on staffs uh, recently at Seven Special Forces Group. You know, these are all the things that civil affairs teams can provide. We just need to actually uh, look at them. We need to just engage with this and understand that this is important. It's messy. We're not always going to get it right. But I'd argue that we haven't gotten it right thus far. So we need to try. Um, and invest in relevant capabilities that can provide those answers because um, we're over reliant on some capabilities that simply weren't designed to do that you know, within the scouts and the intel. No, thanks, Sean. Hey, so we got some great questions rolling in. Keep them uh, coming uh, and we'll get to them uh, after one more comment. So, um, Nick, 
uh, you were just uh, recently out of uh, out of Ukraine, I think just a week or two before the war started. Uh, that's clearly the big elephant in the room. Um, and you did some studies there for some various folks. Um, tell us, what, what do you think we could have done better uh, to be better prepared? I'd say that, you know, the, the conflict, what we've seen uh, in Ukraine in all directions is evidence of what happens when we don't take this kind of stuff seriously. You know, if you look at the Russian campaign plan, you know, I'd argue they made a series of assumptions about the human domain, right? About what it means to be a Russian speaker in Ukraine, about what it means to be ethnically Russian in Ukraine, about the legacy of the Soviet Union in Ukraine. Um, and these were assumptions, right? They have to have been assumptions because any kind of investigative effort to figure this out would have shown very clearly how wrong it is and how much wronger it's gotten almost at an exponential pace since 2014. You know, people could be all these things, Russian speaking, ethnically Russian, you know, somewhat nostalgic for the old days, and also a patriotic Ukrainian. And, and the Russians missed this completely. Uh, and it wound up being a, a massive hole in their entire campaign plan. And, and you see the status quo as a result. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I don't know that our response is taking this seriously either. Uh, when you have, you know, civil affairs and civic forces within the armed forces of Ukraine actively calling out for support, for training, for help. Uh, and we're being effectively denied the opportunity to deliver it. It's not happening. Um, why are, you know, are we taking civil resistance seriously in Ukraine? Where is that line of effort? If there were ever a campaign to do that, surely it's this one. Uh, and despite a demand signal from inside of, of Ukraine, we're not doing it. Uh, so, I think if you look at the conflict there, you know, the the one actor, the one stakeholder who's gotten this right or closest to right are the Ukrainians themselves who've been quite clever around the use of information about the mobilization of different elements of society. Uh, and I think there's something we can learn there. Wow, Nick, no, thanks. Um, all right, so uh, we got about 10, 12 minutes here. Arnell, did you want to jump in or no? No, sir, you, you got lots of good questions here. Trying to start packing. Yeah, so time. the first one from uh, Steve F. How does the human domain, specifically irregular warfare, contribute to integrated deterrence? Uh, I'll start with you, Arnell, since you hit on integrated deterrence. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that's from my man, Steve Ferenzi, another 59 strategist. So it's a good question, Steve. So I, I did highlight integrated deterrence, and I thought, you know, in my opening comments, I went pretty quickly to get a lot of stuff on my chest here, but to, to emphasize it further, I mean, our network of relationships really matter. I mean, I'm not just talking about state between states and, and allies. I'm talking about on the ground, local. I mean, one thing we, we, we've emphasized in that article is the need to go local, you know, go small and impact big, be, go, be hyper local because that's where problems emanate and stem from and then and spread out. And I think that's what we got wrong over the years is that we are trying to address a lot of our challenge regionally or nationally when these places that we're operating within in the jungles of the Philippines or the, the hinterlands of Afghanistan, like the problems were local. And so we need to have an understanding of locally what's going on. So for the human domain, you know, one thing I want to say, sir, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a plug here for the debate that happened before the, you know, the, the webinar, you know, people like General Cleveland are reaching out and other leaders that are still, you know, helping uh, mentor a lot of us. And, you know, one of the arguments that we've, you know, and I think I'll address some other questions that are in the chat, but what is that we're arguing for? What do we need to change? I mean, who owns this? So like what organization within the government is, and, and within the US military, within the army is owning irregular warfare? Who's owning it? Is it USASOC? Is it SOCOM? I mean, we do, I do think you need to have ownership and I do think we need to have people specializing in the region, studying these problems, building these human networks and having databases and information, you know, that, to do the stuff that Sean and Nick are talking about to, to get the, the information on the ground, synthesize it, operationalize it in a way that we can start to make an impact and inform decision makers to make sure that they, they know what's going on. They're not going into an environment or making decisions, you know, without the right amount of information. So I uh, hope that kind of addresses a couple of those questions over. No, thanks, Arnell. Hey, so uh, Ed B just sent in a uh, question here. Uh, thanks us for our thought provoking comments, but he'd like to hear our thoughts on the SVABs and a better way that the, these activities could link to civil affairs activities in a more holistic way. Uh, many partner nations, uh, militaries desire things that the SVABs 
can't deliver. For example, uh, he says uh, security sector reform, medical training, um, w w helping the population. So uh, not necessarily the SVAB mission. So, so how can we better integrate that? Because I know you just talked about some headquarters to kind of manage all the different um, tools in the U.S. government's uh, kit bag. But, but it seems we're coming up a little short there. I don't know who wanted to take a crack at that one. I'll take a quick stab at it real quick. Is that, you know, right now I mentioned 4th SFAB is out there, out east, and they're doing this with civil affairs teams. Civil affairs teams are helping work with interagency partners, humanitarian uh, organizations to help manage the refugee influx into Romania and Poland, and, and they're working with the SFABs. And so I think they're stitching up together their, uh, their efforts well, so they may be someone to take a look at and learn how they're doing it and what they're learning from their, their current experience. Um, but one thing that has been a frustration of mine as I went to different countries, operating embassies, is that we, we, did, we need to be a team of teams um, where, you know, just like General Stockwell, when I first met you, you were in uh, Army Central and I was in Soxen. Nothing other than us wanting to talk to, you know, connecting to each other, nothing forced that integration. And I think we need more integration in these countries to synthesize our effects while we're talking to each other. Because there's a lot of activities in different countries and they're not stitched up. And so... I should have an idea if I'm going into country X, what the foreign military sales programs are. I should know what are we pushing for? What does that, what does our partner need? And then I could feed that back into the, into the, in the you have a feedback loop into the network, back to the, to the arm to go, whoever's in charge of this to go, Hey, in this country, they're really asking for this, but we keep wanting to sell them that. I mean, we got to listen to our partners. Like I said, we don't want to appear transactional and I can't emphasize that enough because everyone's looking up to us now, but we don't want to see our, our power decline because they see us as being transactional and we're not the partner of choice. No, thanks, Arnell. Hey, may, uh, uh, um, over to you, Sean, about this one right here. Uh, if we're looking at strategies and tactics of uh, the competitive landscape, uh, it, uh, it's evident that using uh, commercial and civil human intelligence, that it informs on the ground of reality in real time. So how is CA working with industry to capture realities um, with traditional, um, uh, they they used informants, but, but but with whom we're connecting out there that Arnell talked about, that um, Nick talked about, not just the branches but the the roots of the tree. Uh, Sean, what, what 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 what's been going down down in Southcom there? So yes, sir. I'll address that. I would like to just quickly uh, address the point uh, back to the SFAB stuff as well. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think honestly, there was an opportunity that we missed to integrate civil affairs forces in, into SFABs uh, or into the SFAC in general. Uh, we just disbanded some civil affairs units or in the process of doing so. Um, and understandably, there's cuts on the table, right? It's it's army wide. Um, but I think there was an op a missed opportunity there to integrate that capability into the SFAC um, so that those those questions, you know, as the SFABs, their partner forces are saying, hey, how do we properly engage with the population or, or whatever uh, they may be bringing to them, there's a team there or a company there that is integrated in with them that can then uh, do those things. Um, I think sometimes we get hyper-focused on uh, as a military, like we need to train, 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 you know, tactically, battle drills, et cetera, which trust me, very important. I grew up in combat arms myself. I, I get it. Um, we can't do without those things and we need our partners to be capable of those as well. But you know, again, I think we just focused on the 10 percent there in that in that um, in that instance and, and ignored the 90 percent. Um, and then so back to back to the question you just asked, sir, I guess I would say, um, you know, informants don't don't have informants. Uh, however, we do. We pride ourselves on when we go into these countries and we're conducting civil reconnaissance, we're going in these areas and understanding who are the key influences in, in these areas. Uh, what is this network of neutral and friendly actors within the area? And how is this threat network overlaid with that um, to integrate or, you know, um, you know, get the resources that they need in order to operate in that area? You know, those networks provide the answers to that. Um, and we have persistent engagements. This is not a civil affairs team does not deploy to a country for six months and then come home and no one else is there. It's persistently there. We are persistently in these regions. We have the answers. We have the data. We just need someone to say, hey, come to the table. Let's integrate this. And, and honestly, as a, as a branch, we need to we need to be a little bit more assertive in that and say, hey, we have the answers that you're looking for, Commander. These questions that you have, these PIRs you have, we're the only capability that is out 
in the environment right now, they can answer those for you properly and give you an accurate uh, answer based on what the local population is saying. No, uh, thanks, Sean. Hey, um, Arnell, you were at Futures Command uh, when it was kind of uh, born there. I, I mean, is, 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 are these technology solutions, and you've addressed it a little bit in your opening comments, uh, but why 20 years after we first went into Afghanistan, a few years later into Iraq, do, do we not produce for the commander a, a, a civil common operating picture that the threes can maneuver forces on, commanders can give intent to achieve effects, and, and that are integrated with the, the twos as far as um, uh, we're permitted? Uh, maybe briefly address that, and then I'll try to get to one last question, and thanks. Yes, yeah, sure, I'll do that briefly. So, um, yeah, at the beginning of the Futures Command, um, we the Army's priorities were, as, you, as many of you already know, as in the audience, were long-range fires, you know, vertical lift, you know, blah, 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 blah. But the, the, the thing you're talking about in terms of having a common operational picture that has a civil component, I mean, right now, where I sit in the uh, NATO Allied Rapid Reaction Corps in the G5, when we're told a war game, and this might address another question that I saw in the chat, you know, on the on the table in the SOP, there's a map of all the maneuver and, and all the battlefield control measures. And then there's supposed to be another map with the human terrain, what Nick used to provide to the U.S. Army when he was on the human terrain teams. We don't have that anymore. There's a massive gap right now because who's going to do that for you? So that's why when I, when I in my opening comment, I, I try to give a picture of what this might look like. But commanders need to turn to somebody and say, hey, first John Acosta, tell me about these people. Because, you know, big data, social media scraping, it's not going to give the answer. He needs to be like, as he said, he'll tell you like, yeah, I got teams that have been there for, you know, X years. This is what they're like. You know, this is what, you know, this is what you need to know. These are the, there's these corruption networks. Don't work with this guy or that girl because they work with Hezbollah or what have you. And we, we need a database of this stuff. We need to have that information. And I don't think we have it right now. No, I appreciate that. All right. We'll take one qu last question from Vincent L., uh, uh, to anyone that wants to jump in, and then we'll uh, turn it back over. Uh, so, Vincent L., my initial thought is that in the old days, uh, quote unquote, it was the Department of State that we looked to for long term, in depth understanding of culture, history, and politics. Um, all the many, many contexts in which the Army would need to operate. Uh, that is the kind of knowledge that comes with years of study and within a foreign culture. I believe we still need this kind of expertise. So I'm not really sure if he's advocating that states should do this and the military should just read the country report, but I think we all know three cups of tea and relationships aren't built once the conflict starts. So that civil reconnaissance needs to go on. So um, maybe over to you, Nick, about how to build that. My, my initial thoughts is like, yes, you know, the civil environment, let's call it, is well within the domain of state. It is the domain of state. Uh, but there are challenges of access and granularity where, you know, state is positioned right now. And I think I'm fairly representing it to give a high level view, you know, a national government level view of a, of a given area. OK, key leaders, key stakeholders, macro level dynamics. All right. They're not physically able. To, in some cases, to get out of the embassy with force protection and the rest as it is. But by manpower, by limitation of access, you know, it would take a much different positioning of state globally to deliver the kind of insight that the army would need to operate. Uh, and, you know, short of, again, a major reorganization and reorientation of state down to a more granular level, uh, I think the army has to step in and, and sort of do this for itself. And to take a view that is tailored toward the army, because you know one of the questions in the chat was you know around you know if we can't do this in America, how can we do it in another country? Well, that that kind of backs into a, a fundamental point is that no one is going to give you comprehensive understanding here. There is no chance of, of ever getting full understanding of of any country, however big or small. What you can do is take a focused, structured investigation into things you know matter. All right, and to do it consistently at scale, right? And if CA is following a process, the two is following a process, the SFABs are in, and there's a shared investigative approach. Integration is a whole lot easier. Information sharing is a whole lot easier because we're asking the same kinds of questions with a shared view of what the end state should be. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you. Or, or no, please. Yeah, I'll go quickly. Um, that's a great question, sir. I mean, I, I do think that there is a big gap between a soldier and diplomat. And we argue this in our writing, um, how we, we need to, the, the army might be, you, your unit, your team might be the principal point of contact in a country. And so therefore you are a warrior diplomat representing the United States army or, or the nation in some regard. And the State Department, you'll find a lot of the places I've been to, I'm sure Sean and Nick has been to as well, is that the State Department doesn't leave the confines of their compound. They're not going out, the diplomat's not going out into the jungles of the Philippines or the jungles of Colombia or the hinterlands of Afghanistan to, to work with the local indigenous forces. And then that, there, there's no substitute for that ground context. So yes, we're not gonna know the local people like, like we're not gonna be like natives, but we gotta do something, right? So we gotta, get, we gotta do our best to go in there and exercise some humility, listen to our partners and allies on the ground, and then make sense of it to translate that to our commanders so that we don't make, you know, maybe we need to abstain, maybe we need to take action, but we need to make better informed decisions and we need people that can do this. So what we're asking for is an investment in these types of capabilities. And it might not be something, it's not high-end technology, but we're not saying it's gonna be, it's gonna be very expensive. It's gonna be a reorganization of these capabilities so that we can, you know, you know, get better yield and effect out of these organizations. I mean, why, why is it that the most senior people, you know, just for my example, but in the you know, my, my personal example in the, in the so affairs regiment, you know, First Sergeant Sean Acosta has plenty of experience, but he stops being operational when he becomes a first sergeant because he's handling a lot of admin stuff and doing DTS and all the other admin stuff of the day. But why isn't he employed? Why isn't that company and the battalion and the brigade and hire? Why are we not echelon and ready to deploy and, and, and operationalize his headquarters to make an impact in the environment? I think we need to take that kind of footing right now and compete more effectively to make sure that we don't lose anymore. Yeah, I appreciate that. Sean, did you want to jump in for a few seconds there? I did, sir, just very briefly. Uh, I just wanted to clarify some things, right? I, I feel like there's a there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the capabilities that the Civil Affairs Regiment brings. Uh, one of my largest issues with our former doctrine, FM3-57, was that it said we were cultural experts. I'm going to tell you up front, I'm not a cultural expert, right? Um, what I can do is I'm culturally aware of what is going on. I know how to, to operate within these areas. Because many of the guys on my teams are from these areas. Many, many of us have been there multiple times. We understand those things, right? We're not saying, as, as Nick said, we're, we're not, you're not going to get a comprehensive understanding. But there's fundamental questions that the commander needs answered that are either, one, not being answered, or two, we're, we're not giving uh, accurate answers. Um, and then he, he or she is planning off of that. And then we're maneuvering elements because of that. And, and again, you know, uh, just kind of goes back to, uh, all of that that we discussed earlier. And then the last point I kind of want to make is I just say to anyone listening in the audience right now uh, to really take a look at what you, like what innovation means. Is innovation simply technology or is it can it be simply a redesign of the current structures that we have, organizations and units? And I would argue that we're going to get more bang for a buck reorganizing, restructuring, looking at things, integrating uh, across different branches uh, versus spending large amounts of money on, on technology platforms. No, Sean, thanks. Hey, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much today. You know, I would just add from personal experience, you, you know, it, we have to figure out the, the, the different services. Uh, it, it's a joint fight out there. Um, it's multi-compo. Uh, you know, Arnell, you and I were able to, to breach the, the compo one, compo three, um, sometimes uh, speed bump, sometimes cement wall. And uh, it, folks are just going to have to go after it. And Shauna talked about, you know, the restructuring. And it wasn't helpful that if several years ago, the Navy got rid of their civil affairs capability. The Marine Corps get, got rid of their active duty. Um, you know, where's that inter-service memorandum of agreement or understanding that says, okay, the Marines are dropping this, the Army's going to pick up this, uh, who's identified the gaps, you, you know, but because the army's um, cutting civil affairs structure and a senior leader just said recently, hey, OK, we get this this human stuff, this uh, we're, we're going to stop cutting civil affairs. Well, we'll see. So, uh, well, what an exciting uh, noontime chat. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, General Swan, sir, thanks for your time today and the uh, AUSA noon report platform today, sir, over to you. Well, gentlemen, thank you for a very, very thought-provoking uh, conversation and a very timely one given some of the world events that are underway uh, 
in our, our current lifetimes. Uh, I want to bring some uh, future events to your attention before we depart today. On the 20th of July, AUSA will hold its next coffee series event with the Honorable Gabe Camarillo, who is the current Undersecretary of the Army. The inaugural AUSA Warfighter Summit and Exposition will be held 27 and 28 July in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and this will focus on soldier uh, equipping and uh, soldier issues, our first opportunity to do that here at AUSA. And then on the 3rd of August, our next coffee series event will host Lieutenant General Jody Daniels, the Chief of the Army Reserve. These are just some of the great speakers and events that we have coming up here at AUSA, and we hope that you'll be able to join us for one or more of these events. For more information about any of these activities, please visit the AUSA website at ausa.org for more information and to register for free. Finally, we wanna thank all of you for your membership in AUSA. Your membership matters. Frankly, we can't do what we do at AUSA to support America's Army without your membership. To join or to check on your membership status, again, go to the AUSA website at ausa.org. Gentlemen, once again, what a great discussion, very timely. We appreciate your insights. And for everyone else out there, have a great Army Day.